some of our staff actually came up to me and said, uh, can, we, can we create an environment of worship that seems a little more uh, uh, supportive to the community idea? Right? Instead of uh, people just scattered all over the place, can we just kind of gather people together? And that, that's what I want to do all the time. And, and one, one idea that they had actually very strongly suggested was, uh, can we not have anybody go up to the loft? Uh, because there's no reason to. It's not like there's not enough room. Uh, and I think loft is also occupied by the people who are serving and they need to move back and forth doing their immediate things. And unless there's a reason to be up there, uh, let's, let's close that up. Well, you know, you know what we did? We used to put ropes in the back to close up the area. And then remember I prayed about how, I preached about how were people who live not by sight but by faith. So I said, let's remove those ropes and uh, let's, let's have in our own minds these invisible ropes <laughs> that we really ought to come up and kind of join everybody together. So, I mean, you know, I guess one thing we can do is put up a sign that says, uh, upstairs only for those who are serving in media for at least this service. Maybe that's what we should say as a policy. And there are a few people up there. I, I don't want to make you feel awful right now, but I, I do want to... A lot of you were going up there, and I, you know, I, I said in the back, stay downstairs, and, and most of you complied to that. Thank you so much. And you are very good, some of you, to move much, much up, much more up than you usually are. This is all good. So I just want to say that worship is not an individual act. It is, a, it is a community thing. So when we behave more like a community, I think we get a lot more out of it. Singing gets a lot more powerful when you hear one another sing. And you know, it's, it's, there's a difference between personal meditation and coming together in worship. So let me just encourage you. You know, there's a word in Korean that nobody likes to uh, have. It's chansori. You know what a chansori is, Eileen? Never heard of it? Chansori means like petty chat, small talk, not, not in a small talk sense, but always like pecking, 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 telling people to do this or do that. And this sounds like chansori to some, I'm sure, but I, it, this is what we want to do as a community. Good to see you all and some of you visiting. And uh, it's always great to be a worshiping community. Um, Pastor Joe is called upon to preach for youth today. Uh, so he made the announcement and gently left the room. But I do pray that he will really impact these children today or these teens. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. <clears throat> Ezekiel 22. Um, I will go to verse 17. Even though I would love to read the entire chapter, I will begin with 17 and then read down to the end. Um, and I will try my best to give sense of this passage to you. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me, dross to, dross to me. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead in the furnace. They are dross of silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it in order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath, and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with a fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it, as silver is melted in a furnace. So you shall be melted in the midst of it, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I have poured out my wrath upon you. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the land of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence in my law and have profaned my holy things. 
They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, this thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. <clears throat> Last night, um, my oldest son and the family visited our home, and uh, it's always chaotic because now the little ones are all over the place and the house turned upside down, typically. Uh, not something I like to see set on Saturday night because I'd rather concentrate on Sunday's preparation. But it was still good. I haven't seen them for a while. So one of the last conversations I had with my son, the oldest son, who is a, um, he's a, he's a pastor, and he also is preaching at his church today. So we talked about our preaching, and one of the things I said to him was, uh, uh, Justin, that's his name, I said, uh, Justin, I have a really tough passage to preach tomorrow because it's all about judgment. Uh, it's wrath of God from beginning to the end. So I mentioned something like, well, it's 99% judgment and 1% grace <laughs> in this passage. So it's very hard to uh, bring this passage to the congregation and uh, um, have people be blessed by it. And, you know, he's a, he's a very good christ center preacher, I think, as a young preacher. He said, but dad, it's all about grace. It's all about grace. Uh, but then we all know um, you cannot have good news without bad news. You got to know the bad news in order to know what the good news is, right? That's what you need. Uh, he quoted somebody as, as having said that, you know, you know who said, you need bad news in order to have good news. I said, well, that's plagiarism because that's what Paul said in the Bible. Uh, every time he presented the gospel, he always presented the predicament that we have because of sin. So we're going to talk quite a bit about sin. And, you know, you heard many things about sin. But I'd like to begin by introducing another passage, um, which I was meditating this past week. I actually went to um, see my mother, who is physically a bit in challenging time uh, this week. So this was a passage I meditated on the plane on a long, long six-hour ride, uh, which is Psalm 19. And the question the psalmist asks is, uh, what's the purpose of the Word of God? And there he is really mindful of the fact that when God speaks, he's not just telling us fluffy things. He's not telling us easy things. He's telling us some very hard things. He's pointing out our faults and our sins, and then he points us to a better uh, life ultimately in Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. He says, moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So what, what we have in, in the scripture, especially in a passage like Ezekiel that we read, is a warning. It's, it's God saying, hey, take heed, watch watch um, how many friends come to you time after time to tell you what's wrong with you how many friends do you have who do that I, I, I said friends not enemies right do you have friends who tells you what you need to hear like you know the, the, the proper way to do it is speaking truth in love I mean do you have friends who do that to you regularly but in a sense that's what a community is 
we grow by being confronted of our sins and our faults, but not in a judgmental way ultimately, but in a renewing way, in a rest, restoration way. It's to repair us, not to destroy us, right? Uh, scripture does that. Scripture gives us warning. It gives us uh, uh, a view, a picture of sin, not only in us, but around us. Humanity as such is fallen into sin, and that's been exhibited throughout history. And Ezekiel, we're talking about a bit of history that goes back 2,000, six, 700 years, or about 600 years, yes, 2,600 years. But it's really not that different from what we see around us today. Uh, but these things are spoken of uh, in the scripture to us in love. We are being told this again and again so that we may heed this, we may take it as warning that our lives will be not destructive, self-destructive, other destructive, destroying our relationship with God. Therefore, our lives eventually turn into futility and uh, just waste. I mean, life is not about just getting bigger and greater things. It's not about collecting bigger toys. You know that already by now. I mean, by now you know that life is not like that. You know, your happiness is not measured by the size of your toy box. There's something far deeper than that. And, and ultimately, don't we know, don't we have enough maturity to know that our relationship with God that's characterized by peace and joy is what is the basis of our ultimate and, and, and fundamental happiness? That, that, that sense of well-being that, that comes to us on a quiet night as you take a stroll in a, in a cool of the evening, that sense of serenity, knowing that you are at peace with God and therefore you are at peace with one another and your heart is so welled up in this sense of, hey, purpose, to love, to promote something about God's character. That's what it is. So, I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know what ultimately brings you this sense of fullness. And when God warns us about our sins that takes us to the wrong direction, instead of feeling like, oh, that again. Do I need to hear that again? You should actually say, praise God that he's warning us again so that we will not fall into a life of this futility, but this is what it says. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous meaning sins that you deliberately, voluntarily commit. The sins that you just do it just because you don't care. And uh, some is saying, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. I love that. What sins are domineering over you today? What do you know are to be the sins that are recurring in your life in such a way that it debilitates your relationship with God and others? I mean, life is not that difficult to figure out. I mean, yeah, you do need some basic means to live a decent life, but that's just in our contemporary society, you know, it's, it's there in a sense. What makes life life is really your spiritual wellness and the relationship you're, you're, as a social being, how well you are at peace with one another, how your family is a place of peace and support and love, not a constant strife and kids growing up in this sense of fear uh, and just chaos. You know, you know, it's, 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 it's the church that is uh, a community building. It's mutually supportive where you grow together. It is good to complement and encourage one another in the context of the church, meanwhile, struggling together to overcome sins. It's beautiful. That's what it is. You, don't, you, you, you want a, a situation where you're not domini, domin, dom, dominion by. Let me, let me put this. Let them not have dominion over me. Right? Not, not, not domineered. I, how come that doesn't sound right? You know what I mean not being overrun by sin. So 
This is what the purpose is for God speaking to us this way. Okay? Having said that, I'm going to go back to Ezekiel chapter 22 with you and make sense out of this a little bit and then focus on what God's remedy is for us. The structure of Psalm 22 is, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 22 is quite interesting. When I say structure, it's not a poetic structure, but there is a, a certain frame that is being uh, um, presented to us. And ultimately, I think the picture that uh, Ezekiel is drawing here as God is speaking through him is that there is a, a total failure in the society of Israel, now represented by what remains as Jerusalem. There is a total failure, and the total failure is exhibited by the leadership. And leadership in Israel in the Old Testament time is characterized by three main offices. You heard this many, many times. So you have kings, and you have prophets, and you have priests. They all have their own roles. You know how important it is to have some kind of accountability scheme? Why three offices? Well, they have different functions, but at the same time, they are accountability partners. You know, king is a king. He has a civic duty to rule justly. But king is not always in the right place. So king sins. What do you need? You need priests to bring about forgiveness and healing and restoration, not only to him, but to all the people who are wronged by him, right? So you, you need priesthood, but also you need prophet who tells the truth. David was a great king because he had Nathan, a great prophet, who would come to him and say some very difficult things that other people couldn't say to him. So in order to have a healthy leadership or healthy society, you need to have people saying to one another in an accountable way, right? That's what a democratic idea is, right? Our society is guided by a government that is mutually accountable. So you have the, red, what, what do you call it, legislative body, there's the administrative body, and there's the judicial body, right? You know, you know the whole thing. And, and by them, there is certain accountability. A totalitarian government has what? Basically, the administrative body dominates all the other, and they just follow whatever the guy wants to do. And that's... Not the right way, especially if it's just in a completely wrong direction. But in this passage, what God is observing and he's, he's declaring is that all three offices are absolutely corrupt. Absolutely corrupt. So you have king represented here by the word princes. Princes. In other words, people that are uh, grouped together along with the king as the royal, royal family. They're the ones that are uh, ruling the nation. And then you have prophets, and then you have priests. And it, it's put in such a way that those three offices are named repeatedly twice in that way. So verse 6, behold the princes of Israel. And it, and it goes down to uh, verse 26, uh, I'm sorry, 25, the conspiracy of her prophets. Verse 26, her priests, okay, so you have princes, the prophets, and the priests. And then it repeats again, it repeats again, 27, her princes in her midst. And then 28, the prophets. And then you might say, well, where's the priest, the reference to priest one more time? Well, it's actually in verse 30 where it talks about the intercession that is needed and no one's there. Because priest is the intercessor. Just, used in, uh, just using a different phrase. So here you have two repetitions of this set, right? Set of the leadership, okay? Princes, prophets, and priests. And what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? Well, one thing that characterized the princes is their violence. A word that is repeated at least about five times. I, I read through and counted. And there are at least five places where the shedding of blood is mentioned. What they do is they're shedding blood. They're killing people. Verse 6 is representative. It says, Behold the princes of Israel in you. Everyone according to his power have been bent on shedding blood. They are using their power for violence. Why do they do that? Well, because they're just bent to evil. 
Their hearts are craving for their self-satisfaction and nothing else. And it is revealed by this, verse 7, father and mother are treated with contempt in you. Well, these people have no regard for authority. They look at the parents and they say, I contempt you. You're people that I consider worthless. And that is so, so sad, isn't it? The sojourner suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widows are wronged in you. People who are powerless, typically in the Old Testament, they are referred to as sojourners, people that do not have their home. They're homeless, fatherless, one who has no protection of parent, and then widow, one who has no husband to carry the name of the family. And this is the Old Testament reality. And, and these three things are representation of the weak, the powerless, socially disadvantaged. They need help, Right? And God says, I am for them. I'm, I'm for the sojourners. And the way God puts it is beautiful. He said to the Israelites, you are all sojourners at one point, were you not? You were runaway slaves from Egypt, but I rescued you. Remember that. Do not persecute foreigners in your midst. Don't threaten them. Don't make them feel scared for their lives. You know, don't threaten the fatherless when they do not have natural protection over them. Don't mistreat widows because they have nobody to protect them. But they did. They shed blood. And uh, they are sexually perverted. I, I didn't read that part because I, 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 it was a bit disturbing to me. Not, not a very good passage to read on Sunday morning. So you could go home and read it. All kinds of sexual perversions are named here. What, what, what does that mean? I mean, what, what is sexual perversion? It's basically you are giving into your physical basic desire and just going with it with no inhibition. Why? You have power to do it. You have money to do it. Well, thank God there are laws forbidding people to do certain things to destroy others in this way. But in the old days when law meant nothing, you know, that you could do whatever because you're the princess and nobody will stop you. Remember what David did, even a good man David broke the boundary of another man's wife. And he was so much in power that he could just cover that up. He could actually kill the husband, not by his own hands, by using the enemy's hands. Everything could be manipulated because he had so much power. But remember who? Nathan is the one who came to him. The prophet said, look, God saw what you did, and it's evil. David had to repent. People here, the princes, were living a life simply to take their desire as far as it would go. I mean, they're beastly. They don't care. They have power. They have money. They had everything. One other sin that they committed is, is financial sin. I, I didn't... We didn't read that part either, but the, just before verse 13, you have that whole section that, that, that they take bribes and they take interests and profit and make gain of your neighbors by extortion. So just, just financially uh, taking advantage of others, you're literally stealing other people's properties. And that's what they did. And there's nobody to stop them because they are in power. How about the prophets? Well, prophets kind of went along with them. They were violent. They killed people. It says prophets made many widows. What does that mean? Like husbands were just somehow um, consumed by them. And, and, and there's this, this very curious um, expression uh, in verse 25. The conspiracy of our prophets in our midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. And human lives, the actually it means the soul, soul, the mind, and the spirit of man. This, this is what the prophets did. Prophets used their religious position to consume people's souls. That's a scary statement. You know, what kind of people consume your souls? What kind of people can take you and basically, you know, just manipulate you to a point where your mind and your soul is just soaked up by them? 
oh, this is, this, this, this is the horrible, horrible picture of a false religion. Where it continues to say the prophet has false vision. Prophet creates his own ideas about what people should hear. They say God said this to you, but God never said it. I mean, I, imagine the mind of God, how upset he would be. You know, I get really upset when people use my name and say something that I didn't say. How about you? I mean, don't you hate it when somebody says, hey, Eileen said it when Eileen didn't say it. You know, I, I, I hear that once in a while from, from our church leadership. Well, some of the new people, some of the new people at church uh, tells me, you know, so-and-so who's a deacon at, at, at this church said, Pastor Park said, Pastor Park said this, and uh, you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't do, you should do this, or you shouldn't do that. And when, I, when they come and talk to me about it, I said, I never said that. I never, I never had any comments about that. And that's certainly not what I wished. But people said, well, this is what he wished. I mean, don't, don't you hate it? Don't you hate it when people misrepresent you? Then that's exactly what the prophets did about God. What's fearful about this whole thing is, is just, it's the, it's the possibility of fabrication. You know, me, I'm standing here and I'm preaching and you are all looking at me. It's a scary moment because, I mean, who am I accountable to? I'm accountable to God. But am I telling you the truth, really? Uh, if I had no accountability to God, if I had no regard, if I had no fear of God, imagine what I would do. I mean, I, I, I told you this before, but, you know, preachers love to have great illustrations because illustrations does the job, right? A nice story to tell. Uh, I used to do a lot of youth preaching when I was young. I'm still young, but, you know, when I was younger. And uh, youth group folks, you know, you, you can't really preach to them without telling some very, very funny or sad stories, right? So I had set of those, my ammunitions. So... Uh, when I go to youth retreats and something like that, I know I have about 10 great uh, um, illustrations to use, one for every sermon or two for every sermon, for the beginning and, and the end. Because at the end, you got to tell this story that's a killer story. That just, they just go, oh, oh, I'm so broken. And then they have to cry or they have to laugh or whatever. You know, there has to be some kind of opening to their emotions. So I, I, I use those illustrations and uh, uh, after a while, I used them so many times, I, I couldn't tell what was really the truth that, that I experienced. So all, all the illustrations I used to use were life illustrations, things that I've experienced. You know, when I was, you know, when I was 25 years old doing this, I was going from one place to the other, and there I met this woman on the way, and this is what she was like and all that stuff. And I would just talk about it, and people would just laugh, and people would cry because I talk about it in such a sad way. And then after a while, that actual thing that happened, uh, I have no recollection whatsoever. I can't remember. I, I, I don't know what happened because I've told it 100 times or more, and now the story has become whatever I said. Uh, but that's, that's the danger of communicating. You think you, you do it, why? Because that works. These prophets are basically religionists. And they say whatever they say. They even use God's name in vain to basically manipulate the people, to suck up their souls like a lion reaching out for praise. Um, I don't know. This scares me. <laughs> there, are, there are spiritual leaders who have no regard for God, and they would do anything to bring people to attention and eventually to sell themselves. Um, I, I, I was in Seattle for a few days, well, actually not a few days, it was a passing by location, but I had met a couple there who were, was struggling with church life and um, I heard about this pastor who sued the church. Um, and I, I won't go into it, but it, it's so obvious to the congregation that pastor was just out to get money, even from the get-go. Everything, so many things out of his mouth was about 
becoming rich. He was obsessed with it. He was an investor. And at the end of the life at that church, well, he was actually let go because he was financially dishonest. And then he sued the church for bigger severance. And that lawsuit is still going on. Well, you guys better be careful if you want to get rid of me because I'm going <laughs> to... So when I, when I heard that, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. Because these lay people's words were like, Pastor, I think he would rather see the church closed than not get what he wants. Um, I, I, and, and then the priest. Priests are, this is important, okay? The priests are doing this. They are, um, verse 26, have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the, and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the clean and the unclean or the unclean and the clean. They have dis disregarded my Sabbath, so I am profaned among them. And I'll, I'll just summarize this as this. The priests are the ones who are to bring people to worship, bring people's attention to God with sacrifice for forgiveness of their sins, meaning being reconciled in the right relationship with God, and then ultimately to bring them to the authentic worship experience. To have them stand before God earnestly, honestly, able to approach God's throne with prayer and praise. <sighs> Purity of worship, maybe that's just too far from us. I don't know. I, I don't want to say too much now about this because it could come out in a wrong way. But, but I do worry about it. You know, how pure our worship is before God. How pure is your worship before God? I mean, don't I make it clear enough to you that when we meet together for worship, this is not a casual time. This is not a pep talk. By definition, for the Reformed people like you and us, we're supposed to be. Worship is standing before the awesome God and approaching his throne with reverence and all. With a commitment to give up our sins, to be changed by his sight. You know, there, there's something awesome about the reality of worship. And is there anything that I am doing here as a leader of worship that makes everything seem just a little too casual? The problem is, in the history of Christianity, there was a huge debate. Well, this is not a problem. There was a debate about what is proper for worship. I mean, some people argue about that today, you know, what instruments are admissible and what instruments are not, what words should be used and what words should not be used. There are churches that would only sing psalms from the Bible, no hymns. There are churches that would not use any of the instruments but use completely a cappella, just the voices. I'm not advocating that. I, I think that's a little too limiting, in fact. But what is being done there is there is a very, very careful idea of what's admissible in our worship of God. What do we give to God in offering? You know, what, what are we doing? Is there care given? And reform the principle is so-called, it is admitted as long as the scripture explicitly commends it. You do what you do in worship because God commands you to do it. Well, there are people that are much more relaxed about it. They say, well, we do anything that God did not forbid us to do. We could do whatever we want. There's no order in worship. You could just do whatever as long as God says don't do it. But I think that's so misleading. There's order in worship. There's call to worship. There's closure to worship in benediction. There's praise. There's prayer. There's preaching of the word exposition, which is not based on anyone giving testimony. So we don't do testimonial sermons here. We don't have people take turns and just tell people how their week was last week. That's, that's, that's not a Sunday worship. It's worship that expounds the word of God with due authority given to the word. And we hear it. There are things that we do 
and we should do better. And especially as worshipers, I think you need to do better. We have no dress codes here, right? We don't expect you to wear ties or whatever to church. But then somewhere, somewhere along the line, I think you need to draw a line. You have to draw a line about time. You need to draw a line about, you know, what you bring in and out of this chapel. You need to draw a line about, you know, what you do while you're sitting here, you know, what things you can do. I mean, you don't bring your homework here to do homework while you listen to my sermon. You don't bring your, you know, daily organizers and come here to just, oh, sermon time, great, I'm going to do my time organization here, you know, just work on it, or chatting with a friend or something like that. I mean, you, 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 you bring things. I mean, there's a whole thing about, oh, you know, is it allowed for us to bring coffee to the sanctuary or should we bring this or that? But I'll tell you what, I think to a degree that's silly. Well, how, how old are we? How many years have we spent in the church? And is it all about showing reverence to God by taking this, not taking this? But I'll tell you this, if there's anything that you do here, that you know that in your heart is just think, making things casual. I'm here to just, I'm just here to just hang. You know, wherever you are, I'm just, I'm just here to kind of be a spectator. And if I have not challenged you to not to do it, if I have never challenged you to change that mindset, I'm committing the same sin the priests are committing. That's pretty sad. Okay, I better wrap it up. God sums all this up by saying this. God said, why, why are these people like this? And, and the Lord said this. Verse 12, but me you have forgotten. This is the hard issue. You have forgotten me. God said, you, you are not mindful of me. Why is this so serious? Because God is the one and only point of reference for our being and our thinking and our doing. He is the maker. He is the authority. You know what that means? Everything came from him and everything will ultimately be accounted to him. That's what we believe. Christianity is not a religion of God being our genie. Remember what I said last week? Oh, just tell me what you want, I'll do it for you. You are not the point of reference, but God is the point of reference. It's about God, but you have forgotten me. You have forgotten about me. What does that mean? You're just doing whatever you do because you have forgotten the true point of reference, the authority. As a result, all the lines are erased. Families are not kept as family, one man, one wife, together, having sanctified children as the covenant homes, bringing up a life of worship, that boundary is broken. You are so willing to break it for sake of what? For the sake of your fleshly desires. You break the boundary of property. You cannot take other people's property without the proper transaction that is just. You can't steal things. You can't extort things. Why? Because you have power to do it. No. God set the boundary. God set the boundary to your power. You are not limitless in your power. You may be a king. You may be a priest or prophet. You may be a pastor, but you are not boundless in your boundaries. I put you where you are, God says, because that is the proper thing. That is the right thing. You are a man. You're a woman. You're a, how, you're, a, you're a wife. You're a husband. You are a child. Relation to your parents. You are a parent. You are what you are. When you consider this in the point of reference to God, not point reference to yourself, whatever you want to do, not saying, hey, this is what I want or else I'm not going to have it. When you disregard, you forget about God, then anything goes. But when you remember God, when you have him as the point of reference, and finally, one more thing I would say from the passage is, 
God who is going to bring your life to audit. The final accounting. If you have no awareness or even fear of that, if there's no fear of you, there's no wisdom of godliness. That's the problem. There's no fear of God. I'm going to have a little talk with some of our youth today. I even have a time appointment, 2.30 in my office. So we got to have a short EMSC today because I'm going to have a talk with this <laughs> group of youth. And uh, why? I, 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 I never expected this to happen, but um, it's a concern that the parents brought. It's a concern that the, that the staff brought. But there's a problem that is detected, and that was just the wrong thing to do. And they all came together and said, we'll stop it. But then they're doing it again. I mean, it's, it's, it could be serious. So it was brought to my attention. But what am I going to do? To be honest, what, what, what can I do? What am I going to do? Threat them? Threaten them to do what? Tell their parents? Parents, no. They don't care. I'm going to expel you from church. Hey, thank you. I don't have to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when people have no fear? You know how parents always threaten kids? If you do that one more time, and then kids will say, then what? Then what? You tell me. What? You're going to beat me? You know, then what? You know. Right? What, I mean, what do you do when, when, when children get to a point where they're just daring anything and everything because there's no fear? I'll just go around, walk around and shoot everybody. Well, well you're going to get arrested. You know, you might even spend your life in jail. Well, I don't care. I don't care. So what? No fear. You know, if there's no fear in you, healthy fear... There's no stopping. But God warns. God warns them. What will you do? What will you do? In that last day when I confront you. Okay. Does God have a plan for us? Um. There are a couple images here that I could talk about, but uh, I'm going to skip one and just going to the last one. The image is the wall's broken down and the enemy is coming and there's nobody to protect the city. And God is looking for a good man who will stand in the gap, keep the city, the boundary alive. Somebody to take the fury and the fiery judgment from God in order to protect the people. Nebuchadnezzar is coming. The Babylonian army is marching. Will there be anybody who will be standing in the gap to keep the city strong? At the end, verse 30, and I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. There's nobody. Praise God that God's plan was to provide one. Jesus Christ is the intercessor. He's the one who stood in the breach. He's the one who kept us from the ultimate fiery wrath from God. In fact, Fire is good now for us because fire is purging. It is cleansing rather than destroying. Trials and hardships for us is not a damnation, but it is God's fiery baptism to bring us back to life. Are you going through that right now? Ultimately, it's Jesus Christ who stands as our great intercessor to save us.
in Jesus Christ, everything changed. Everything changed. Now we have an opportunity to turn around. All the things that are being said here, these are not jokes. I'm not saying this just to amuse us ourselves. This is not said just as a mere suggestion. It's not said so that, oh, it's Sunday, we should hear something like that. This is not some, you know, twisted, bent, psychological illness that we have. We love to talk about sins and just somehow get some strange, evil pleasure out of it. You know, I like it when people talk about what's wrong with me. At least I feel like I've done something worthy. No, it's not, not like that. It's in order that we may be people brought from darkness into light, that we no longer may be dominated by the sins, but to be rescued and delivered, that we may no longer live a life of being unmindful of God, but be completely honest and open-minded towards God. That we may not be the people of rebellion, but we may be the people of worship. Jesus is the one who gives us this new life because he is our intercessor. Turn to him and find your life in him. The promise is that God will give you a heart surgery to take away the heart of stone and place in you a heart of flesh, a new heart that will delight in the Lord. And your life will be restored. Let's pray. Father, we heard of many sins that these people committed and truthfully, they're not that far from us because given the power and the opportunity, we could so easily fall into indulgence of sinful flesh. The scariest thing is that we lose that perspective, the true point of reference. We forget who you are. In fact, we forget you altogether. Somehow we become fearless. Or perhaps we are fearful of the wrong things. When it comes to true fear, we have lost the direction. Thank you for the word that is a warning to us. Young or old, in this place right now we pray that because Jesus is our intercessor, because Jesus is our purifier, because Jesus is the one who affects our hearts, that we may fall before him and repent. That we would turn to life because Jesus is the one who now gives us a new life. We're not the fallen Old Testament church that didn't quite have the right direction at all. But because you have done the faithful work of bringing things to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now we have you, Lord, through your son Jesus Christ working deep in our hearts and in this community as well. Lord, would you lead us forward from where we are into a deeper and a greater spiritual health that we may not be so lost that we don't really think about even what is right and wrong, but we would daily love you so much that always will think in our hearts what would please you what will give pleasure to your heart? Because you are the fountain of every blessing for us. Bring your people deeper heart of love and commitment to you, we pray. Don't let anyone here simply come and go without 
finding your accountability at work in us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.